So, um, I introduced my committee uh, yesterday. Um, the person missing, because he's enjoying himself in Rome, is uh, Brian there. But have you ever seen such a reprobate gang? Uh, would you choose voluntarily to work with these people? Um, I think it's, you can see the difficult task I have. Um, nevertheless, they, they have given me huge support in putting on this conference, and uh, they are a great team to work with. We'll just excuse the looks. <laughs> slightly stretched, right? Slightly stretched. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Makes you look all chubby chops, <laughs> Right. Um, so, um, the, um, our team's been in, in existence for about six years. Um, we've got various ambitions, and one of them was to create a rolling program of affordable research for the benefit of osteopathy. Um, <coughs> what we did for this study was try and create a research model, a research template, that we feel could be replicated through the profession. What we feel is that we are better clinicians than we are researchers but that we have a strong research interest and we have a strong interest in promoting research within the profession. We are facilitators trying to help this to happen, which the conference is part of the uh, mission of research education within the, um, within the profession. So what, on advice from Brian, we, for this study, we um, had a budget of seven and a half thousand pounds. Right now, in modern day terms, that is absolute peanuts. When I went to talk to the University of Bedfordshire about conducting a study, this is about um, four, four years ago, we were talking of six figure numbers and probably nearer £300,000 to be able to use a, the university resources to conduct a meaningful study. That's clearly beyond the means of, of everyone. We're grateful for the um, SCC board for them providing that funding, that seven and a half thousand pounds. But we aren't trying to get something for nothing, but at the same time, we're just trying to get our foot in the door, trying to get things rolling, trying to get things happening from our own point of view. So we, for the seven and a half thousand pounds, we invited tenders uh, to conduct, uh, we decided on the topic, which was a, a data collection tool, a series of questionnaires for anyone, um, to conduct a prospective study. We then invited tenders. We had three people, three different universities um, apply. And out of that, CAMA, CAM Associates, a research team from the University of Sheffield, were the winning bidders. Their contract took them from um, all the methodology, establishing that, right through to, to when the paper, the, to producing a, a final paper for publication. That paper has been submitted to IJOM, it's come back, amendments, and this takes an interminable long time to, to get, get it into print. And the amendments have been made and it's been resubmitted back to IJOM, which happened in the early part of October, we're awaiting that to go back to their reviewers to see whether we've answered their questions satisfactorily, and then hopefully we'll get a publication date for the new year sometime. It may still be rejected. That is always the possibility that uh, they may still reject it. But it should be there. Um, our next, we're, even before the results of the paper were out, were out which we were actually using because it's a sort of gathering general information about um, the practice of cranial osteopathy. We hope that it will generate a series of research questions that can form the, the basis of future research. But because that information wasn't re really available to us, we decided to proceed on the next study to um, go through the whole process of you know, gaining funding, um, and we have had to up that funding to seventeen and a half thousand pounds. Now, Anne Jekyll is going to talk about that study. 
she, there's, the, there's the next study uh, on infantile colic and she's going to follow me to give you a brief overview of where we are with that process. But it's the same model. We invited tenders. The um, postgraduate research team from the, uni from the ESO uh, were, the, were our preferred bidders. A slight complication was that there's a bit of incest about this because Anne is also a member of our, our committee, which means we've got to be absolutely watertight about how we were dealing then with the contractual obligations and with the whole proposal. Uh, you know, it made it, we actually had to be quite hard on Anne just to, to you know, create that difference. At the same time, she's, she's stuck it out and she is still part of our research committee. So uh, I think we've proved that actually we can work quite well. <coughs> So the background to this study was that in Australia, a recent survey by the AOA found that 13% of all their osteopaths use cranial 80 to 100% of the time. The only comparison of that was, an, was the NCORE survey, which was done in, and written up in 2010, um, uh, which was circulated amongst the whole the general profession. And this this found that. 26% um, of the osteopaths they canvassed used cranial techniques some of the time. They didn't actually distinguish between whether this was all of the time. So the aims of this um, data collection study were to describe the practice of a community of osteopaths using the cranial approach. Nothing is, was really known about our practice habits. Um, and then we could compare that with the results of the NCORE survey. The NCORE survey has not been published. It's available online, but um, for various reasons it, it's, it's it not been published. It is about to be published. It is already. It is, a, yeah, it yeah. is about to be published. Because yeah. 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 I checked that with Brian, who thought no, it was. Yes, I've seen it. I've seen my Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great. That, that. Yeah. We also aimed, we, by splitting it between our full members and our pathway students, we aim to get a stratification, so be, to be able to, to enable us to get an in-house comparison of um, you know, how the full members perform as compared with the um, pathway members with less, lesser experience. So I'll be giving some comment on that, and I'll also be giving some comment on the differences between the survey of the um, SCC community and the general osteopathic population. So what we came up with was obviously patient profiles, reasons for treatment, treatment approaches and responses to treatment. And actually after that has come an insight into the big osteopathic family, where, how we fit in, how we differ. But we are all part of that osteopathic family. I have to say the, we had to write four extra questions. So we used the MCOR questionnaire. They had, after their experiences in publishing in 2010, they, put, they produced a short format that was still valid for the purposes of this, of, of us using it. And we produced four extra questions, um, particularly pertaining to cranial. It took hours and hours of telephone com, uh, conversations. Casper was part of that with Caroline Tosh. Um, to establish just four questions, and the original NCORE survey had something like 40. So they're not easy things to pull together. Um, but anyway, then, you know, that was, our, that was part of our experience. Now, I could go through things question by question and watch your fall asleep. You know, it's a, it's a lot of facts and figures. And I, I make no apology for that. Sometimes you need them. Um, but I said what I've broken down in is patient information and how that might have translated into, into your practice marketing, to, um, to use the word, into what we could deduce about the effectiveness of our treatment, about the general practice of osteopathy, and then about the differences between osteopathy in the cranial field and general osteopathy. So the general uh, some of the general detail was that we had 270 practitioners that we canvassed. Um, we had 80 expressions of interest. Ultimately, 58 practitioners decided to take part in the survey. They each had 10 
um, questionnaires to distribute to new or, or patients returning for a new episode of care. We had 530 returns, which 400 were needed to get a statistically relevant result. The ratio of full to pathway members within the SCC was 6 to 4. <coughs> uh, males to females, one male to two females. Were, were, this was in the osteopaths who responded. What does this say about females? Maybe more diligent in doing the paperwork, whatever. Maybe the old thing of being able to, to handle more than one thing at one time. Um, but the average, there, there was reflected a fair degree of experience in practice of 22 years. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of reason, we would hope to have some reasonably considered answers and, um, and a reasonably considered evaluation from that. So, one of the things is that 63% of the patients that we see are female. Now, I'm not saying that you need to decorate your treatment rooms pink, <laughs> <laughs> but, but if your practice is going to be camo in camouflage colours, very male oriented with hunting trophies around the walls. It might not go down with the majority of your patients. So you actually have to consider that in your practice decor. It has to be comfortable to females. They are producing two thirds of your patients. So you, it just makes sense to think about this. Um, likewise, in the under two year olds, two thirds of those were male. Males are delicate things, we know that, we do need to be Okay, so you have your pile of toys in your treatment room, there we go. Um, but if they're all dolls, and two thirds of your patients are boys, they're not going to feel at home, are they? Well, they might do, then you might get some who, who feel at home with that. So you do need your selection of Tonka toys, and things that they can crash and bash, and run up and down ramps, and things like that to be able to keep them happy. This is just, I know it's logic, but it's actually just interesting seeing it is confirmed. Most of the patients seen in our practice were employed. Um, so we're seeing very few unemployed people. 93% were paid for by the patient or their family. So really, again, a very small percentage paid for by insurers. 93% were white European. Are we really talking to the ethnic minorities? And in some of the cities, they are, that's quite considerable. You know, is this, when we're looking at a crowded profession in the current, surely should more ought to be done to make these communities aware of the benefits of osteopathic practice? You know, this is what, what I mean, is that it, it is of relevance to the general um, osteopathic community. We looked at the effectiveness of treatment, outcomes of care. So of those um, 530, 54.3% completed their treatment by, you know, within the time allowed, which is, I think was four weeks. 28%, so just over a quarter of those were, had, were receiving ongoing care. 12.3 of them percent didn't keep their final appointment for various reasons, no money, forgot, maybe they were better. Again, we don't know about that. The average number of sessions taken for treatment was 3.1. Right, and I'll give you the comparison later on with the general osteopathic community. Keep you in suspense. Now, treatment reactions you have a very gentle form of treatment. We, I think we tend to feel that our treatment reactions are minimal, that if people are going to be HVT, they're much more likely to be, um, to, you know, have reactive flare-ups. But then, nevertheless, 32% reacted within the two-hour, two-day two frame after a treatment. This is after the first treatment. At the end, 20 out of the 530 reported continuing reactions. But let's have a closer, slightly closer look. What do these reactions consist of? Well, increased pain, quite uh, significant, okay? Um, fatigue, well, we'll all relate to that. Patients often go out of our treatments 
you know, like slightly spacey and, and quite tired, often sleep, particularly after the first appointment. Um, increased stiffness, okay, for those 48 hours. There is positive re reaction, but actually it's fair, you know, people feeling completely um, relaxed, and then headaches and nausea and stuff like that. Okay, so the, we are getting this. Now, again, I'm going to tell you later on how this compares with the general osteopathic community. We incorporated into, into this study um, a visual analog scale of 1 to 10, where 10 was the worst, worst pain ever. Um, now, this wasn't in the original survey, so we haven't got this as a comparison with the original survey. But for 510 patients, um, there was a mean of just under 6, 5.95, which gave us a range of some people reported 10 out of 10 in severity of pain. They were in a bit acute discomfort, um, right down to sort of 2 or 3. The majority were really in the 7 to 8. So actually they were in quite a considerable degree of pain and discomfort. All right? Um, I think that has comments is, is that, you know, that for a long time the perception of people doing the cranial work is that we didn't see acute people and tend to see more chronic problems. We didn't see acute people. But actually the figures don't bear that out. We are seeing very acute people and they are in a lot of pain and discomfort. Okay? Now, at the end for 439 patients, we were down to 2.38, which was a p-value of 0 0.001. That's just highly significant. Right? So we can say, actually, we are doing our job. We are getting them better. They're, they're showing a um, significant decrease in their, in their pain or their symptom. That'd be great, but remember this isn't, there's no control. All right? So we can't actually, you know, that would be a real thing to, to boast about, to brag about. But without the controls, we can't take that as a serious scientific statement. All right, we can't go saying that because it, you know someone said, "Well, where's your control?" People might have got better anyway. They often do. Um, now that might form the basis of a future study. All right, to have your controls. All right, so that then you can consider, you know, are we doing what what we say we're doing? There were 236 of those who completed treatment, and their start. Um, uh, VAS scale was a 5.92, and at the end, 1.55. Again, a highly significant um, result. At the end, if you took the, the overall lot, 64% were much improved or best ever, but there was still 8%, less than a tenth, were the same or worse. So, you know, we like to feel we can help most people, but actually one tenth nearly one tenth of, of those people we see we've made no difference or even slightly worse okay so you know it, it's tough for us to think about that was in a, a month's treatment period. this is over a month yeah yeah so this is over a month um now i said about the aoa and the n core studies um one of the questions we put in was um did you actually did you actively come seeking cranial work. We didn't ask why, okay, but um, in, in doing an evaluation of what sort of techniques they, they were going to receive, they were, it's come out that they're less likely to receive HVT, soft tissue and articulation. And maybe it is, you know, I think in our practice we do get people who say, you aren't going to give me a forceful manipulation, are you? Equally well, you will get some people who say, well, I've always been. Um, you know, cracked up or, or, or whatever. But I think there are a significant number of people who do not want to be treated that way. And I think we can, you know, re always feel, a, I always used to feel that there was huge pressure on me, you know, from people to say, oh, just put me on my back and clear it. And I'll all be right. And, and, and you're just saying, well, no, actually, that's, you know, that's not why you're going wrong. Um, but actually, there are a significant number of people who don't want that approach. Um, now I looked at the um, the 
symptoms people presented with. 66% of two thirds presented with muscular pain and stiffness. Okay, there. 10% um, with headaches. 13% were colic or unsettled babies. If you combine the unsettled baby and the colic together, that's 13%. The other problems might be ME, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, breathing issues, earaches and tinnitus, balance problems. Quite, quite significant balance problems. Again, this is all stuff that we can put on our wish list for future studies. We can say, well, let's look at, see what we can do to affect these different problems. But this helps to inform what we're going to do next. Looking at the sites of um, areas that, that we tended to see, um, well, A, first off, before we do that, 58% were for acute symptoms, where they'd have their symptoms for less than six weeks. Okay, so that's quite a significant percentage. We are seeing people who are fresh, they're not necessarily chronic, it's not necessarily a picture of seeing chronic. Thing, but 32%, one third, had symptoms greater than 13 weeks. So again, I think that you know that can be our real challenge. Can you make a difference to people who've got an established symptom pattern that they've had for a long time? In the sites of symptoms, head and facial area comes up fairly high, 16.8%. Lumbar spine, 19%. So we're not treating just heads. Um, and then pelvis, hip, etc. Um, thorax, ribs, cervical spine. You know, you say what what we're doing is treating the whole body. We happen to include the head, um, and I think this this bears it out. So who gets the bragging rights? Okay, who's you know in comparing the two? Um, you know, can we say where the you know, we did it, you know, we do it better, which of course we'd all like to say, but um, as I said, we're going to you know, give you now the comparison between the, the NCORE survey and the SCCO survey. Um, that's similar practice, dominated by muscular pain and stiffness. The sites of pain differ in that Throughout the whole osteopathic profession, which remember included some people who practice cranially, um, lumbar areas were 36%. Right? In fact, I've got 16%. It was 18% on the uh, on the SCC survey. So, you, you know, generally they're much more likely to see lumbar problems. We see them, but um, you know, not so many. Cranial problems, on the other hand, um, seen in the profession, so cranial related, head or facial problems, 7 to 17 percent, like much more likely to be seen um, problems in this area. Patient age ranges. Um, similar age range that we, that we tended to see, but we're much more likely to see from 13% to 4% generally in the profession, we are much more likely to see children. Similar gender, ethnicity, so again, throughout the profession, two-thirds women, one-third um, men. Patient, now there's, there's no real statistical significance to this. Um, we might say, oh, well, that doesn't make a difference. We are getting that patients better, quicker. Um, but for us, it's, it was 3.1% 3.1 sessions as compared with 3.5 um, over the general profession. I thought that, that was something to go for yeah, about, but um, I'm told it's not, it's not statistically significant, so forget about that. Okay, um, rates of treatment reaction, 32% um, for us, 40% for the general profession. Again, that's not statistically significant. I thought it was, but it's not. Um, but this is very similar to, to um, rates of reaction to acupuncture as well. So, you know, it's quite interesting then when you're bringing in other um, professions. <coughs> and in doing a comparison of full versus pathway students, 
form members tend to use many more technical approaches. So we, we ask them to list down, ask people to use the one of the, some of the extra questions, to list down what sort of techniques they were using. The experience told us to that, that that fluid approach wasn't working, that, so we're shifting to be able to, that we were doing many more things within a treatment profession, whereas someone new to it would do just, persevere with just one or two things. Now that's not uncommon. And I'll give you an example of the experience Liz and I have. We both ride, we both have dressage lessons, we go to a really experienced teacher who's lovely. Uh, we both have horses who have needed quite a lot of work. Um, bringing them on. Now, Beth will climb on a horse, we'll, we'll be struggling away, and she'll say, uh, why didn't you try so and so? Oh, right, okay, so we'll persevere, like, this isn't working, but you know it's not working, but not sure what to do next. Beth will climb on, and instantly, uh, she, you can see that she, oh, no, no, she's trying something else. She, she's instantly evaluating and instantly shifting her approach. And lo and behold, that horse does things that it will never do for you, and it's most frustrating. Um, <laughs> But that's the example of experience over, so novice versus, versus expert, all right, of, you know, how people use their experience to evaluate their, that response under their hands and immediately be shifting on. And they can't always, this is an intuitive, instinctive thing, because they won't always be able to say why they've shifted into taking that another seemingly quite diverse approach or why they've Maybe they bred the health, maybe we instinctively read the where the health is, and they're going to work with that. It's not a prescriptive approach. So we are shifting to meet the needs as we go. Right? Well, actually, it'll be far more prescriptive for someone embarking on the pathway until they've got the experience to know instantly that's not going to work. Okay, so it's quite, just quite interesting. <coughs> Pathway members were still much more likely to combine cranial with orthodox approaches. Um, HVT, soft tissue, articulation, they're much more likely to, to embrace those as well. So my final thing is that what's really come out of that is there aren't startling differences between us and the rest of the profession. <laughs> and I think that's really reassuring. Because it's very easy to be divisive, to say, oh, well, the cranial lock, they're just really odd, and we ought to, uh, what, what was that, um, well, Dave, Dave, you remember that, <laughs> early, early on in, in, the, in the 1980s, someone wrote saying, um, the cranial osteopaths ought, ought to be put on an island out, Pitcairn, Pitcairn, the Pitcairn Islands, Islands and, and left to rot and, and fight amongst themselves there, but actually we, we all recognize our principles and philosophy of osteopathy. Um, we're using different approaches. Surely that's the strength of osteopathy, that we can, it allows us to use whatever pro approaches we feel happy with doing. For us, we can find an individual approach it's having similar responses. We are part of that big osteopathic family. I think there's a lot of reassurance to be got from nothing which has come up here which is contentious which is you know makes anyone is really startlingly different sure there are differences and it's quite interesting to be able to understand that and work that within our profession but overall it's a big osteopathic family we're very privileged that it's a worldwide organization that we all that we can that allows us to express ourselves individually and uh, and work for the benefit of osteopathy worldwide. Thank you. So while um, I think Anne sets up, has anyone got any questions for Clive? Yeah, yes. Um, did you notice any regional variations, or did you take into account any kind of in the selection or in the results you got back about utilisation of technique and stuff like that. Did you, was there any regional... Where, where the people use... Where the people <coughs> practice. Where people practice, most in the south and southwest. Yeah. Did, right. did, it's just that I, I did it, I'm going to send it to Liz, but I did a, for the 
postgraduate diploma that I did in OCF at the BSA, my thesis, my research project was on very much about the utilisation of technique and people's views of whether they were generalists or right. specialists. And I, I chose OCF, obviously. Yeah. As the thing. And there's huge regional variations. So when there's... What I realised was I was really glad I did it because it actually meant that, that I had got a, a representative sample from the whole country. And if you only do the south and the southeast, you get an over... Over the too great a number of cranial osteopaths. Yeah. Um, it gives a sort of slightly sort of I, I, I'm going to send the project to, to oh, this, so maybe it might be of so interest send, to you in tiny. No, I, I, I think that's very. What it came out is that most people were from the south and southwest. We hadn't yeah. thought that there, there would be a any sort of variation in what sort of approaches a group, uh, you know, southwest cranial people, whether they were any different to. Hillary working up north, or Tim working up north, or, or it was more the number of cranial osteopaths yeah. who work, you know, and the amount of cranial so used in the per full session. in the full paper. It was uh, came out south and southwest. Okay, but it was more that the pathway people would use more cranial than the the, the full members would use more cranial, and the people who were still doing the pathway used less. Right. Uh, used cranial in conjunction with more of the MET, ATT's articulation. That's what came out. That's cool, yeah. Um, yeah, like yeah. the general population. Yeah. yeah, a bit more like that, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has anyone, yes? Uh, something else. I mean, I remember when you sent out the invitation for this study, and I kind of couldn't respond to it because you needed to have like 10 new patients. If, uh, in the week, which well, I... Or in the, in, in the time span. In, the, in, in a very also, short time span. There was span. also uh, another reason, you, because some of the questions in the full study, which I hadn't brought out, involved what national health contact you'd had, what national health, um, serv you know, what treatment you'd had from our health service. Well, obviously, that would have counted you out, um, unless you got a comparable NHS system. So. We couldn't actually accept anyone then from out of the country. Yeah, but what I mean is like that study would only kind of include cranial practitioners who have that kind of practice where they see a, a lot of new patients, like they have kind of a lot of all, patients. All, 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 all people could, returning for new episodes of care. So it could yes. be old patients, but they haven't been into the practice for a couple of years, yeah. and they're returning for so they, they could be... Because, I mean, I kind of was thinking it is quite, in both studies, it's quite a low percentage mm -hmm. of people actually going in and, and, and doing, doing the study. Yeah. I mean, it's only like, it I don't ten, know, 15 it was percent. percent and, it was 10 percent with the yeah. NCORE study. Yeah. And we thought we were heading for about 30 percent when it was 80, but ultimately worked but, out. But, I mean, it's actually quite a low percentage um, of the general uh, even then that, that's, population that's of... That's generally considered a good response rate. Yeah. In, in, in response returns, uh, as any of these students, the Swansea students here, well, you know, with your dissertation, you know, what's considered a good response rate? Did you send out surveys and survey monkeys? Um, Ten percent is con considered a good response rate. Just to speak to that, Ava, I think it's because we were using the short form of the NCOR questionnaire because that was already validated. So we had to basically use the same formatted questions to make a, a comparison. So the, the, given that the NCOR survey looked at new episodes of care, we could only do the same thing no, no. to make those valid No, and I, I think that's wonderful. And I think it's wonderful to compare those two exactly. studies and I can see why it needs to be set up differently. I would just yes. suggest that it only reflects a certain yes, type of practices within our yes. the practices yes. that we've got. That's all I wanted to but say. It did, it's not it meant as I think there's a reasonable window I mean, of uh, time for a few mutations, I think. Yeah, I mean, I did the survey, and, yeah. and initially when I read it, I thought, crumbs, I'm not going to have that number of new patients. But because they allowed you to have returning patients with a new problem that you hadn't seen for a while, I did. I think actually I only had nine. I didn't quite make the ten, but I still sent back my nine within the time frame and it was over quite a few months that you had that time to collect those patients coming in yeah.
Okay, any other very quick questions? Yeah. Okay, I'll take two and then we need to move on. So just a quick comment about patients coming to ask an osteopath, osteopath for cranial osteopathy. I love cranial, I love it when people ask, but I always ask them slightly what do they mean to make sure, do they mean just cranial? What they usually mean when they come to say that is just be gentle with them. Yeah. Yeah, so you can actually use a lot more of a mixed brain. And, and I think that was, obviously some people have shown, some people have been, you know, I've got a head facial problem, sinus problem, whatever, I need to go to someone who deals with heads, but cranial seems to fit the bill. Um, but then, but what I think our overriding thing was that actually people wanted a, um, you know, softer form of um, treatment. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one last one. Oh, I just missed, you said you added four questions. Yeah. So I've got the visual and analog scale. Did you actively see cranial? What techniques did you use? And was there another one? Um, I can't remember what the uh, fourth one was. No, but we will. If you give me about <laughs> ten minutes okay. during the break, I can tell you. All right. Okay. But yeah, I can't remember. Right. I think it might have asked about. Did, yeah, did you come and see some cranial? Uh, well, I'll look. Okay. Yeah, I okay. think it was something like um, what treatment, how, what treatments we used in the fluids or. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll, we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll tell you. Casper yeah. yeah. was part of the, the original person, um, you know, formulating those questions, the original team formulating those questions, so I'm sure he'll know. Oh, no, I won't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll remember me fairly immediately. Oh, Just himself in there. Completely. I've got it on my computer, so I'll, I'll look. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, Sorry, Dr. Cole, we're going to move on to the next one. Thank you very much.